Good evening. It's good to welcome you back for part three of our ongoing series, Introduction to Orthodoxy, a Basic Catechesis of Orthodox Christianity. And tonight we are turning to part three, Framing an Orthodox Worldview, Christ Revealing Himself and the Foundations of the Christian Proclamation or Christian Preaching. So in part two last week, I'd like to recap a little bit as we begin. In part two, last time we gathered, we introduced an orthodox worldview contrasting an orthodox and heterodox worldview, or various heterodox worldviews. And we also explored some of Father Stephen Freeman's metaphor of the one-story versus two-story universe. We began by reviewing various worldviews such as animist worldviews and Asian practices that kind of point towards a common worldview and different cultures of Asia. And we pointed out the similarities between some of the Asian uh, philosophical traditions and even the Greeks, the Hellenistic Greek tradition of philosophy. And uh, which leads us up to a kind of pre-modern uh, Christian worldview. And we're going to come back to, this is the most important one. We didn't spend time on this last time because we were, fr we were, we were, beginning, we were beginning to explore the worldview theme. And tonight we go further. So we'll come back to this because this is, hint, hint, our worldview. So, then we, we looked at the Enlightenment briefly, which is, I like say, saying it's kind of Christian. It's vaguely Christian. It's, it's, a, it's a paradigm in which there's a quest for facts and the use of reason, and, and there's an attempt to order the facts properly in a kind of scientific way. Uh, that's sort of the legacy of the Enlightenment uh, in our own, our own culture here. And so we're children, in some sense, of the Enlightenment. And we noted that the Enlightenment worldview was shaped by a number of factors, including uh, the Italian Renaissance and, and humanism more generally, shaped by the Reformation and the, the, the idea of an individualized spiritual uh, experience and the study of the Bible, which leads us to this next point, the sort of, if you will, the Protestant focus on the text, which Father Hopko, I explained last time, uh, talks about as the Quranic view of Scripture, where the, the Bible is read like a Quran, uh, the Quran of, of Islam, and we sort of deconstructed that a bit in our last session, which is worth doing. But we're going to keep going tonight. So note how rational, though, all these influences on the Enlightenment are. There's an elevating of what is observable and what is provable, what is scientific. One of the legacies of the Enlightenment is, is brought out by someone like Descartes, who says, to accede to truth, to know truth, it suffices to say that I be any subject that can see what is evident. In other words, what I know, he would say, depends only upon my physical senses, independent of the good, or we would say independent of God. This is a whole new approach that flowed from the Renaissance and the Reformation, and it emphasizes the observable and the scientific method. This is all part and parcel of the same dynamics that are at work in our Western culture. So, um, having elevated reason and rationality above all else, we are ready for something new. We are ready for paranoia about and rejection of authority. This is kind of the legacy of the Enlightenment, right? We, we've embraced the anti-tradition tradition, and that, which itself rejects almost every point of authority. And we see this in our culture today. Um, a corollary of this is that there is a real suspicion of anybody claiming either authority or deep knowledge arising from experience. And so we're, we're stuck with this conundrum then that, that society is in where it's impossible to know truth. If you talk to people at the university, they will say, what is truth? They're like Pontius Pilate. What is truth? They have no idea what it could be. They don't believe it exists. Everything is now relativistic and deconstructed. It's, we're now in what they call postmodernism because all these isms the Enlightenment, the Reformation, all this stuff has been deconstructed and we're stuck in a kind of mess. Nihilism, hedonism, unfettered libertarianism, Ayn Rand, and even worse now, corporate technocracy. It's a, it's a horrific kind of idea. So you either have alternately post-rational or hyper-rational post-Christian approaches that we would say are pretty evil and we're very skeptical about as Orthodox believer, believers. And so th there is no truth in this, in this context, no truth. And all that matters in our current iteration of, of pop philosophy is myself 
and a sense of prosperity. Again, that, that coheres with hedonism and nihilism and all the rest. Um, and so in a sad degradation, our dominant American worldview is less this kind of approach, less, less a philosophy, and more a pseudo-philosophy like this. We end up with the Kung Fu Panda approach to a, a worldview in which it's not nearly as sophisticated as the Ayn Rands of the world and Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos or William Shatner even. It's a lower form of a, a philosophy, a lower form of worldview, which I pointed out last week, uh, we might say, suggests that our, 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 our default worldview is redolent with a kind of slothful hedonism mingled with a religious sensibility. And we, I term this last week following other writers, of course, uh, moralistic, relativistic, therapeutic deism, which, which fits our dueling core enlightenment and post-enlightenment sensibilities, right? We, on one hand, we, we love rationality and science. We want, we want all the facts slanting up. We want to prove it and verify it. And on the other hand, there's a sense that truth doesn't even matter anymore. And so we're, we're really stuck in, in this current reality. Um, but we get this moralistic sense of a kind of faith. And so we might say that qualities of this American religious worldview, moralistic, relativistic, therapeutic deism, could include positing a God who created and ordered the world and vaguely kind of watches over it, kind of a, a, nice, a nice theistic deism. Uh, God, we might say that God wants people to be good or nice or fair to each other, um, as taught in books like the Bible or any book. It could be any book that's sort of religious, it's nice. They're all the same. Um, the central goal of life is to simply be happy and to feel good about yourself. Um, and God is not really that involved in our life unless there's a crisis or an emergency and we might have a prayer service or something or kind of believe in God. Um, everyone goes to heaven, all dogs, all cats, everybody goes. It's all the way it is. And so, um, and you're especially wonderful and you're a special snowflake and it's awesome. So that kind of Kung Fu Panda approach is where we are today. So, as I said last week, uh, not only is this worldview not orthodox, but it also works perniciously against orthodoxy in that it fosters an autonomous independence coupled with a strong belief in personal and national exceptionalism tinged with the late American sense of entitlement, singed with pervasive laziness. This is my, my, my take on where things are, and it's not good. So, where do we go? How do we, how do we move from this? So, the orthodox... For us Orthodox Christians, our worldview is predicated upon the God-man himself creating the world, entering the world, and laying down his life for the world, and trampling down death by death. My favorite hymn in Matins is a very short hymn. We sing, in, in the Russian tradition, we sing, God is the Lord and has revealed himself to us. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. We... We say that, actually in Greek, it should be rendered, in English, it should be rendered, the Lord, He is God, and He has revealed Himself to us. The Lord, we're saying very clearly, this Jesus has, has broken into our world. This Jesus has, we're lost, we have no sense of truth, our philosophies are broken, and into that chaos, into that madness, God inserts Himself. Philosophies can't divine this. Cogitation can't discern this. This is God himself entering the world. The Lord is God and has revealed himself to us. God is with us. This is the fundamental teaching of the Orthodox Church. And this is the basis for all that we're going to discuss between now and the end of the series. And really, it's the basis for our entire life as believers. So, it's worth noting from the Gospel of John, our Lord says, I am the light that has come into the world, that everyone who believes in me will not live in darkness. The light has, has, has been turned on. The light has come and has illumined the darkness. St. Paul says, while we were yet weak, at the right time Christ died, but that God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Despite being broken, despite our, our, our weakness, despite our sins, God comes to us and he brings the truth of the gospel to us in the various ways that we have received it in our life. And so this is a fundamental belief of our faith. Um, we noted in the last week a bit about the onion diagram. And we pointed out that orthodoxy is fundamentally concerned 
not just with our behaviors or morality or, you know, the things on the outside, but we're looking at the very core of this. We're, we're concerned with how we view the world, how we, how we, having an orthodox mind, you might say, a phronema in the Greek. Uh, having an orthodox worldview would be very important to us. Our stuff, our actions, even our morality flows from that worldview. So to be really orthodox, we have to address the heart of things and not just the factual teachings of the church. So, let's follow the onion diagram a little deeper and go inside an orthodox Christian worldview. One of our topics tonight is, is going to be the purpose of creation. Why did God make the world and why did he make us? And maybe a better way to put it is, who am I and who is God? By the way, when I started teaching this class 15 years ago, I used to ask, who is God and who am I? But as I've gotten older, I realized that if I don't have a sense of who I am, I can't understand who God is. So as I grow a knowledge of myself, I can often grow a knowledge of God and vice versa. This like this back and forth. So two beginning texts that are foundational in both the Old and New Covenants wrestle with precisely these questions of who am I and who is God. I want to start by reading from the book of, of Genesis, the Genesis story itself. So I've, I've, I've cut it down. It's a couple paragraphs. But I want you to listen carefully and we'll draw out some things from the creation story. Genesis begins with this. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness... And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, Let there be made a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament, and he divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps upon the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God made man in his own image. In the image of God, he made him. Male and female, he made them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called each living creature, that was his name. So Adam gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the air, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a, a helper fit for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. He took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. So in terms of God, what can we say about what we've read? Well, what is revealed about God's character in the story of Genesis 1? We see that God is the creator. This is an important point. God makes, he creates, and he, he creates, if you will, theologically from nothing, ex nihilo. He is generous in his creating process, and it is good. It, it's over and over we hear the refrain, it, it was good. And all of the things that God is doing proceeds from his, his goodness. It's his delight. He's rejoicing in his creation and the work of his hands. And we're seeing that as part of God's character. 
we're seeing God as maker of man in his own image, which means that the very qualities of God we're going to find in Adam, the capacity to create, to name, to love, to, to, to desire. All these things are capacities that mankind will possess because God is made in the image and called to live in his likeness as well. We see that God is the maker of man and woman, uh, both man and woman. And each are made in his image, though the process is different in how he makes them. But they're both together and they're both of one nature and one, one essence, we would say in theological language. Man was created to love and to be loved, which is an important point to make. A bonus thought here, man's main sin is this, pride in wanting divine life now. He wants to, to, to rush into God's plan. And so we'll, we'll see here as we keep reading, we'll read a little further. This is what's going on. It's not that he's disobeying God's intention. Rather, he's rushing to the finish line before God is ready, has made him ready for what is to come. So let's keep reading here. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And the serpent said to the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Question mark. And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the, of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat of the tree, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said to the woman, You shall not surely die, for God does, not, does know that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be like gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and ate, and gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves things to gird about them. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God, among the trees of the garden. And the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid myself. And the Lord said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten the tree whereof I commanded you not to eat? And the man said, The woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me the tree, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I ate it. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed above all the cattle, above every beast of the field. Upon your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. So we see, uh, we see already this kind of devolving of human nature. Uh, that humanity is immediately turning on itself. And the first thing the man does is blame the woman. And then she blames the serpent. And they're mad at, we presumably know they're mad at each other. Uh, and so begins humanity's descent. You know, um, Blame and hate and fear and all of those things uh, begin to dominate the narrative of the human condition. And yet, we, we hold this passage of Genesis, which is really important for knowing who God is, who we're called to be, and what the problem is. We hold that next to another passage, John chapter 1. Does anybody know when we read John's Gospel chapter 1 liturgically? Pascha. The very first reading after the, at the Feast of Feasts, the very holiest of holy days in the Orthodox Church. The priest or the deacon announces very, very boldly, the reading of the Holy Gospel according to St. John the Theologian, and we, we begin, and we say this. I want to chant it, but I'm not going to. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word is the word Logos, the Logos which was understood to be Christ. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through Him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. 
and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And John the Baptist bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth have come through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son in the bosom of the Father he has declared him. He has exegeted him, literally, in the Greek. He has proclaimed him. And so we find uh, that John is sharing with us in that gospel reading the fulfillment of Genesis, that Christ is, if you will, the, the new Adam, the new man, mankind restored. And we can see a couple of things. Um, God is the fundamental reality in the universe. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. The Word was God. We see the Word is eternal with God and God. Yet, yet, and this is the big yet, yet that eternal Word, that Logos, is made flesh. In the Greek it's sarx, which is, which is a very powerful theological idea. The, the one who is divine becomes flesh. This is right in John chapter 1. The Word is the Creator. And the Orthodox understand that word as being the very one who creates Adam in the garden. And he himself is the light, which again, the idea of revelation, the idea of, of we're in darkness and we're, we're blind, we can't see, and now the light comes to us. He has revealed himself to us. This is the theological point that's being made. And then he, he enables us. He, not only does he show us the light, but he shows us the way. He enables us, He equips us to become the sons of God. And by sons of God, I, I, it's intentional. We're not just oh, all happy children of God. We're sons of God. That means whether you're male or female, you're a full inheritor of the promise. right? All of us, male, female, old, young, are full inheritors of the promise if we will follow Christ. This is the promise of these texts. So, <laughs> okay. So, John's theme is very important. The unity of Theos, God, and Sarx, flesh. And this idea is anathema to the ancients. And it, it, the Enlightenment folks don't like this. The Greeks don't like this. The Chinese philosophers don't like this. Um, the animists probably don't care. Uh, they, they have no problem with God and man. But most philosophies, and certainly most of the isms of our history, don't like the idea of God and man coexisting. In one, And so it leads to this point that I make many times. And those of you who were in my orthodoxy one hour class, forgive me because I'm repeating some things here. But this is very important. So this is why we say with Father Hopko, orthodoxy is paradoxy. He's, Father Hopko famously said this. The scripture is very clear. If you want to find yourself, lose yourself. You want to fulfill yourself, empty yourself. You want to be great, be the least. You want to be first, be the last. You want to be rich, become poor. You want to be wise, become a fool. If you want to, be, if you want to rule, become a servant. Really, orthodoxy is paradoxy. That's just what it is. And if we look at the scriptures, we look at our theology as Christians, as Orthodox Christians especially, we'll find that paradoxes exist all over our faith. For instance, God is all-powerful, yet he is meek and lowly of heart in the person of Jesus. He's even meek in the Old Testament. Uh, God is three, yet God is one. Christ is fully God, yet fully man. Christ in his kingdom is present now, and yet he is the coming one. He's always at hominos, the one who is coming. We are endowed with free will, and yet God somehow foreknows all things. A virgin is also a mother. Death is destroyed by death. He who seeks to save his life must lay it down. He who loses his life will save it. I am crucified with Christ. Nonetheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ in me. All these things are paradoxes that we're holding together. And, and many traditions want to say, well, that can't be. 
And the Orthodox Christian faith would say, no, 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 we must embrace it. That's where you find life. That's where you find the truth is in that paradox, in those paradoxes. The commandments that we've been given by Christ call us to a life of paradox. Anyone who wants to, to love will qu quickly face the dilemma of paradox, right? You hold something too tight and you lose it, right? Everything in our life is full of this, this truth of paradoxy. So uh, St. Ephraim of Syria is one of our great uh, ascetic fathers, a great hymnographer uh, from, uh, I believe it's the 5th century. And he writes this beautiful hymn for the Nativity. One of my favorite hymns. Many of you have heard it before, but bear with me. He says this, wondering about the birth of Christ. He says, Thy mother is a cause for wonder. The Lord entered her and became a servant. He who is the Word entered and became silent within her. Thunder entered her, yet made no sound. There entered the shepherd of all, and in her he became a bleeding lamb, bleeding as he came forth. Thy mother's womb has reversed the roles. The establisher of all entered in his richness, but came forth as one poor. The exalted one entered her, but came forth meek. The splendorous one entered her, but came forth having put on a lowly hue. The mighty one entered and put on insecurity from within her womb. The provisioner of all entered and experienced himself hunger. He who gives drink to all entered and experienced thirst. Naked and stripped, there came forth from her the one who clothes all. This is a meditation on paradoxy. All of it. And in our daily faith, in our daily walk with God, in our thinking about God, we, we come face to face with this tension. We're called to holiness, yet we're called to live in the world, but not of the world. In our history, we have like the church and the empire and the tensions there. We have poverty and riches. We have sobriety, which is enjoined, but also joy is important to us. And they seem to be in conflict, but they're not. You have to have both of them. We have power, which isn't necessarily bad, but then powerlessness is praised if we're going to follow the way of Jesus. We have discipline and ascesis, you know, doing good works and powerful works and taking, it by the, taking our, our life spiritually by the, you know, forcefully. And then we have this idea of freedom and surrender to God. All these things are true. We have the spiritual and the fleshly uh, commingling and co-living co in our lives. So the problem is of making distinctions. Um, in John's Gospel, Christ assumes flesh. But also in John's Gospel, he says the flesh profits nothing. Christ will tell his disciples to eat my flesh in John 6, but he will say in John 3 that that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's in one Gospel. Different uses of the same words. So, so no other idea was as offensive to the Greeks as the cross of Christ because it was a, ming a mingling of opposites that were to them contradictory. Christ as divine and divinity dying. How can that possibly be? So the cross is the ultimate paradox in the very heart of our worldview. Hear that again. The cross of Jesus is the heart of the orthodox worldview because in it we have this sign of, of paradoxy. It is the paradoxy par, par excellence. God is impassable, meaning he can't suffer, and yet we celebrate Jesus as the one who endures the passion, which means the suffering. The, in that very person on the cross, you have the entire paradoxy of our faith. We have the king of glory. He's celebrated as the king, and yet he's ruling the cosmos from the cross as a, as a crucified criminal. Uh, come on, that's madness. But this is why St. Paul will say what he says. To the Corinthians, he says, For the preaching of the cross is foolishness to those who perish, but to us who are being saved, the cross is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to naught the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. For the Jews require a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, 
and to the Jews a stumbling block, literally a scandal, unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto those of us who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. St. Paul is playing with this idea of paradox, right? All over the place. We see the scandal in the history of heresies, classically in the persistent heresy of dualism. That's a common heresy in Christian history, dualism. It always is opposing a robust incarnational theology with the idea that, that God, flesh, and spirit can't coexist. So there's always this tension with the dualist heresy. Um, so, for instance, um, it's interesting to note that all the early Christian heresies downplayed either Christ's humanity or his divinity. And in doing so, they were trying to resolve the paradox of the incarnation. Do you understand what I'm saying? Every heresy pushes one way or the other. And so, Arius, this is a good, there, there are no icons of Arius. There's only, only one I could find is Arius being punched by St. Nicholas. So there you go. Uh, Arius, his heresy, he, he cared about the divinity of God. There's one God, unity of God, the divinity of God, and Christ, Christ undermines that. And so he can't really be God. He's just a mere human. He divides it out and makes it neater in his own philosophical understanding. Docetism, an early heresy, taught that Jesus only seemed to suffer because it was unbecoming that God could suffer. That is not fitting to, to the idea of God in the Greek tradition. And so Docetus denied Jesus' real humanity. The Ebionites and the Incretites, they were, uh, they were radical ascetics who preached uh, mandatory celibacy for all. The flesh was evil, had to be mortified. And they divided out the divine and the human so much that in person of Jesus, they could not imagine uh, he's fully God and, and fully man. Gnosticism was, in a sense, a denial of the flesh as well in its various forms. And so uh, the God of the Gnostics cannot possibly be uh, uh, fully God and fully man. You have to have all these intermediaries that mediate the divinity down to us in, in demi-God kind of ways. And on and on and on. Every single heresy, at least in the first thousand years of Christianity, is doing this. And even modern Christians today, I think, tend to overemphasize maybe the humanity of Jesus and underemphasize his divinity because they're uncomfortable with that. And so there's a tendency, uh, uh, my, my own, I have a relative who was a preacher, and my uncle was a preacher, and he, he actually denied the Nicene Creed because he could not imagine that, that Jesus is of one essence with the Father. And he, he, did, he was not comfortable with that language and cho chose to have Jesus as a friend to kind of help mediate the work of God, which isn't totally untrue. It's just he was trying to get around, if you will, the paradoxy of the Christian Faith, which, is, which betrays the whole point of Christianity, which is my point tonight. I hope you get that. So, all of this paradoxy is contained in John 1. The Word is God. God takes on flesh. All the controversy, all the scandal is set up right in John chapter 1. And this is the linchpin of Orthodox Christian worldview, that God has taken on human flesh, and He's united Himself to us, and is saving us as we unite ourselves to Him. Inasmuch as we unite ourselves to Him, by following Him, by participation in Him, He is saving us. Of course, it's worth repeating that the very heart of our worldview is salvation as union. God is saving us by uniting Himself to us. We say in the baptismal rite, before we baptize, I say, do you unite yourself to Christ? I unite myself to Christ. And I ask three times, it's like nine times total by, by the time it's all over. Do you unite yourself to Christ? This idea is we're uniting ourselves to God himself, which is what a frightening thought. We're uniting ourselves to God. And our entire sacramental structure of communion and, and participation in the sacrament, all of that is about union with God, which is a terrifying thought. It's like straw in the fire. That's why when we pray our communion prayers, the prayers are always taught, burn me not, O Lord, as I participate, as I partake. Let me not be burn up by my sins, but rather strengthen me, fortify me by your loving kindness. So important. One of my favorite uh, contemporary theologians uh, in North America is um, Father Michael Alexa. Uh, he, um, he is uh, married to a native Alaskan, and he spent his entire ministry until he retired uh, serving the Alaskan Orthodox communities, which are native Alaskan 
uh, people are often Orthodox because they became Orthodox uh, through the mission efforts of the Russian Orthodox missionaries beginning in the, in the 18th century. Uh, so anyway, Father Michael uh, is a great theologian and writes this. In the Orthodox Church, salvation is understood as a process by which each person freely chooses to orient his or her life toward God-likeness without compulsion, in humility, joy, and in love, fulfilling the Father's will. No one is saved or justified as an isolated individual. Each person is transformed in community in and through the loving, eternal relationships with other people. The process of salvation begins, if we can properly say that at all, at baptism and continues thereafter, forever thereafter. In this world, divinization, traditionally known in orthodox terms as theosis, proceeds by means of the cross with difficulty, with temptation, with struggle, with pain, and finally with our own death. In eternity, this process continues as each person, purified of all sinful characteristics, suspicions, anxieties, passions, and fears, draws infinitely closer to God and to other people. This process begins with faith and continues in hope, but its content, means, and goal is love itself. So, there's a wonderful mathematical vision. I hate math. But, if you like math, you know if, if you do f at x equals 1 over x, you get this graph here. I think I'm right on that. And it creates an asymptote, which is this little dotted line. Two asymptotes, actually. And, and uh, the blue line is ever, ever getting closer and closer and closer to the asymptote without actually ever striking it, right? Infinitely moving toward the infinite. And so we would say, uh, as we wrap up, it's sort of worth noting that our journey in the Lord, we never become God, right? And this is where uh, I think some evangelicals and other Christians criticize Orthodox. They would say, well, you preach divinization. No, we don't. We don't become God by nature, of course. But we infinitely move closer and closer toward God-likeness, moving towards Him forevermore, which contrasts with C.S. Lewis's vision of hell, and is it the great divorce where infinitely people are sliding away in, into grayness ad infinitum into nothingness gradually we're moving closer God, God help us we're moving closer toward him forevermore in a continual motion that never ends and is never exhausted this is kind of a, a mathematical way perhaps of thinking of these things so it's just, just a metaphor that's all as we wrap up it's fitting to lift up three great truths about God that I think, dance around this worldview of the cross, the cross being the very center of our life. But these three truths were, were, were propounded by Father Alexander Schmemann of blessed memory, a wonderful, a wonderful priest of our church. Also, in, in this photograph, I, I should mention, because I, I really care about sharing stories of orthodoxy with you, because our faith is a lived experience, not just books and stuff. Uh, the bishop in the middle, anyone know who that is? This Bishop Dimitri of blessed memory the founder of our diocese. You've seen his portrait upstairs, the old Gandalf-looking guy. This is him when he was a young bishop. And, and the priest on the right is the priest I told you the story about two weeks ago, the priest who, who saw his family around the altar as he was liturgizing. I knew him as an old man. This is him as a young man. Uh, but these are three great men of the church, including our founding bishop. But Father Schmemann said famously that um, all things were made by God to be good, all things through mankind's brokenness have fallen, and that fall has touched everything around us. And yet, all things are called to be redeemed. This is the great truth of what God has done through Jesus Christ, that all is being called into unity with, with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so we celebrate these, we, we honor these three words, good, fallen, and redeemed. And we think about everything in our life that's broken, it was made to be good, and so we, we can celebrate the good in us, because there's good. We're not, we're not Calvinists. We don't believe that we're totally depraved. But we do think everything's fallen, and that's, that's gotten everywhere. And yet we believe that in Christ those things can be restored and healed, and that's redemption. So that's union with God. That's salvation. That's receiving His sacrifice, and all those things together, following His example, learning from the Savior. So 
Our journey lies in experiencing this redemption and being united to God. My confessor, Father Seraphim, the abbot of Holy Cross Monastery, says, we don't, believe in, we don't believe in a personal relationship with God. We believe in union with God. I like that. We don't believe in a personal relationship with God only. We believe in union with God. That's, that's a much richer fleshing out of the truth for us. So I want to I close tonight by briefly looking uh, over uh, 12 things we might do uh, as part of our rule of life. The, this is a, a wonderful handout from Father T Thomas Hopko's, um, one of his talks he gave. He said, if you really want to know wh who God is, you really want to get to the heart of what we're doing, I suggest you do these 12 things that would inculcate in us, form in us, an orthodox worldview and frame of reference. So if you want homework, this is great homework for you. So here we go. I'm going to read this. Number one, be ready to do whatever it takes to know. Humbly and courageously, do what you are told without questioning. And he's talking about things of the, of the gospel. Lay aside your will. Vow to follow what you, what you come to know, whatever cost. His point is, knowledge requires action. You can't just know it intellectually. You have to follow it up with deeds. Number two, pray for enlightenment. Even if yours is to whom it may concern, pray something like, God, reveal yourself to me as you really are. And as you pray, do not look for anything. Let whatever happens, happen. Number three, while praying this way, read through the New Testament very slowly, at least three times. Take several months to do this. Do not be bothered by what you do not understand, but try to put into practice what you do understand. That's a, that's a tall order. I've been doing this for years. I'm not there yet. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Number four. During this time, go, go to Orthodox services as often as possible. Just stand or sit there and listen. Do not judge other people in any way. Don't be bothered by what you do not understand. Just be there. Go as often as possible. Number five, during this time, do not lie about anything. Do not consciously harm anyone. Try to be kind and good to everyone you meet without exception. If possible, do some good work for others, even if for only an hour to a week, as secretly as possible. Also if possible, give away some money secretly to those in need. We call this almsgiving. The point is, be kind, is what he's saying. Number six, during this time, if you are not married, do not engage in any sexual acts at all, of any kind, even with yourself alone. If you fail in this, put it behind you immediately with a prayer of repentance and start over. Be pure. Number seven, during this time, do not get drunk. Do not eat too much. Do not eat unhealthy foods. Try to eat and drink less than normal for a couple days every week. For example, like fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays. In other words, be sober. Number eight, during this time, sit in total silence at least 10 to 15 minutes a day, even up to 30 minutes a day if you can, watching the thoughts that come to your mind, letting them go with a prayer, God, enlighten my mind. God, help me with this. God, help these people who come to my mind. So be quiet and reach out to God. Number nine, during this time, try to speak as little as possible without irritating other people. Do not try to make your opinions known or accepted in conversations unless asked. Listen to others. Be attentive in their presence and to their needs. Do not argue with anyone about anything. So listen and be attentive. Number ten, during this time, find someone that you fully trust and share with that person your thoughts, feelings, dreams, hang-ups, compulsions, etc. in detail. Do not, however, go into detail about sexual things or about other people. Discuss in detail your family of origin, your childhood experiences, both the good and the bad. Focus on what memories distress and sadden you, what memories bring you joy. Be accountable. Number 11, during this time, do a checklist of possible food, alcohol, drug, and sex addictions, and other addictions that you may think you have. Example, like rage, gambling, shopping, etc. If you see that you are addicted in any way, seek help and possibly enter a treatment program. Number 12, during this time, do your, do your work or your studies as best as you can, carefully, responsibly, conscientiously, and devotedly. Live a day, even part of the day, each day at a time. Focus fully on what you are doing at the given moment. All these things, we might say, with Father Hopko, shape in us a sensibility and lead us to the, to the cross, lead us to the mystery that we're seeing at the very center of our worldview as Orthodox Christians. In our next installment, next week, we'll be talking about sin, the passions, and asceticism, 
and we'll introduce the idea of the communion of the saints. And then the week after that, we begin actually unpacking the holy tradition of the church, looking at the doctrines and the teachings of the Orthodox Christian faith. So this next class is really interesting, and I look forward to, to taking you along with me on that journey. I'm Father Justin Patterson. Thank you for watching our Intro to Orthodoxy series. We're really glad you're joining us for this. We invite you to engage with us in person. Come visit our parish. Come see, taste and see that the Lord is good by visiting our community. Also, take advantage of our website, our YouTube channel, and all the contact information that you'll find on the screen. Thank you very much, and may God bless you.